Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Joyful Telepathy Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Sitka, animal communicator and spirit medium. I help people all over the world talk to their loved ones in spirit and to talk to their animals who are alive and in spirit. To book a session with me, just click the link in this episode's description or visit tofinopsychic.com. This podcast is brought to you by my online course, Telepathic Communication with Animals and Spirit. I would love to help you learn to do this work, and there's plenty of it to go around. I believe that telepathic communication is something that most of us do naturally, and that you can learn how with practice, encouragement, and support. To learn more, visit tofinopsychic.com forward slash class. You can email me anytime, tofinopsychic at gmail.com. And now, perk up your ears and park your fears. Here's this episode of the Joyful Telepathy Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Joyful Telepathy Podcast. We've got a really special one today. This was not planned out. This was kind of spontaneous. And uh, I'm just doing this introduction after I've done the conversation. Um, So Sweetie and I had a spontaneous conversation with Freddie Mercury. And just before I shift into that recording, I wanted to give you a description of what Freddie looked like to me while we were talking to him. So I saw him with shoulder length hair that was kind of frizzed out that he had some bangs uh, and he had a mustache and he was, um, he was wearing a cape, a floor length cape that was black and white. And I want to say checkered, but I think it was more disco ball. It was more, you know, with the movement, it kind of changed. So it wasn't a, a solid color. It just seemed like black sequins and white or black, like a dark sparkle and then a light sparkle. Uh, and it definitely seemed patterned, but anyway, it was really, really interesting. And his suit that he was wearing, he also had this look like, um, like a matador, except he wasn't wearing red. It was more of a blue, dark blue with this black and white cape. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and his, I think he was wearing a small jacket as well. And it. Uh, had sleeves that flared out around his wrists and his fingers were covered in uh, silver heavy rings and he had some bangles that were around his wrists and what um, he had lace up boots that went up to his knees that had a good heel on them Uh, and that reminds me reminded me a bit of prince his footwear um, or i guess prince borrowed from from freddie so that's, uh, oh, and his energy that he came through with was welcoming. It was, uh, hello friend, I'm here. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a huge, uh, wasn't a huge present, was, wasn't overwhelming, especially for someone who was such a powerful performer. He was really solicitous with his, with his energy and was very, um, interested in, me as a medium and how I needed him to be in order to feel comfortable. He was very, he's probably talked with many people, many different mediums. And so he took the first couple of minutes to really just sit with me as I was connecting with him just to hold his energy um, really back in a way and just giving it to me piece by piece until I was I really had a comfortable connection with him because this is someone that could have really come through with a bang. Uh, and that would have been fine too, but he was, he was solicitous. He was uh, really polite with his energy, really considerate, which was lovely. Anyway, we go, we, it was sweetie and me sitting on a couch and, um, having a conversation with Freddie Mercury. I hope, oh, and by the way, Kurt Cobain shows up like halfway through. So I hope that you enjoy it. Let me know. Okay, so we have like miraculously gotten a day off together for the first time in the (laughs) summer. And so we're just hanging out at home, waiting for the car to be repaired, hanging out on the couch. We've got the cats and I was just watching YouTube and this ad comes up that Queen has a movie, not Queen has a movie coming out. There's a movie coming out about Queen and I was really excited and I'm like, oh, sweetie, 
there's a movie coming out about Queen, oh my god, and you're like, I know, and we have to go see it. And it's so exciting. And then I said, like, Bohemian Rhapsody was the very first song that I memorized. Because it's true, I went yeah. to Prince Edward Island with my my best friend and her family when I was 12 years old. And we drove from North Bay, Ontario to Prince Edward Island, which is a multi-day trip. Uh, and along that, that was the first time that I was exposed to uh, Queen, really to anything that wasn't a nursery rhyme or classical or jazz music. <laughs> and uh, on that trip, I memorized the lyrics to Bohemian Rhapsody, and I've known them ever since. And it's like it's become this part of me. But we have never before talked to Freddie Mercury. And I was saying like, oh, we should totally talk to Freddie Mercury. And then I'm watching this this documentary that came up after the ad for it. And of course, Freddie Mercury pops in. And so we just start talking to him. And we've had like so many great moments that we're like, we need to just start recording this right now. So, yeah. um, you know, welcome everybody. This is like my sweetie on the couch, Hi. my wife now, <laughs> <laughs> and me and Rupert and Mikey and Freddie Mercury hanging out. And he says, hello. Uh, and it's just been, he's, he called me, he's like, you're the, you're the Barbara Walters of dead musicians. Uh, cause we were talking to him, to him and, uh, apparently like my reaction to some of the, to some of these stories, it's, um, when I'm in medium mode, I can, I'm just kind of flat. Like I don't have a, I don't have an emotional reaction to things. I do laugh when things are funny though. Uh, you know, it's not like I become catatonic, but anyway, he was teasing me about it and he was, you know, saying, I, I, feel like I could have told you that I had sex with a chicken and you would just be like, all right, Freddie. And you'd just be perfectly <laughs> accepting of that. But where he, um, I th like, I want to backtrack and capture some of the stuff, but the thing that really, uh, got Freddie going, um, was as we're watching this documentary and this, there was talk of this lyricist that wants to interpret the lyrics of Bohemian Rhapsody as it being about Freddie's sexuality and he got so upset by that. Like he like angry, just like, how dare he think this song is about me? You know, he's, and Freddie says like, no, I would never think that small. Uh, and I would never, he, he says he, it's not that he wasn't egotistical because he was, and he had to be, but the art was bigger than even his own ego. And the purpose of Bohemian Rhapsody was to give everybody s something that they could relate to that it was this multifaceted mirror that everybody could see different parts of themselves in. And it was meant to reflect back at people. It was meant, it, it was this creation that people, that would move people. And he says, it, he, when he did say, oh, it was about relationships, which is what w was said in the documentary that he always said it was about. So like, that's as specific as I wanted to get because this song was about, um, the song was about the people that were going to listen to it. And every stage performance was about the people that were watching. Uh, and he, he also said, um, do you need pillows or something? No, sorry, am I being too fidgety? You're being a little fidgety. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting a little distracted, but that's okay. okay. Yeah. Um, just like if there was something I could do to make you more comfortable. No. Um, so, yeah, so he was saying about his stage performances and how um, he sometimes selected costumes that were more feminine than he otherwise would have really worn. Like he didn't feel quite, he didn't feel like himself in it, but fuck it. Because the point of wearing the costumes, it was, it was about his performance and the performance was about the people in the audience. And he cared more about the people, you know, like the, the soft young man who lived in a small town um, and was forced to wear a typical male clothing that made him just feel icky. And he really wanted to wear a dress or a feather cape or something with sequins and makeup and something that made him feel fabulous. And Freddie wanted to be the popular rock star that was going to show the world that it was okay for men to dress like this. And they're just being like Freddie Mercury. So he was breaking down these barriers, not for himself, but for other people. He was going far beyond what he needed for himself. And he had just told that story about when he was at school and, oh, go get a, okay. You get a pillow. I thought you needed a pillow. I needed a pillow. <laughs> Cause you just seemed uncomfortable. Yeah. And I have all of the pillows. It's not like, it's not like I'm sharing. You have all of them. I know. I got my pillow fortress set up here. Okay. Okay. So he was telling that story about 
when he was going to school and he was always, he always had this big personality and he knew how to make, he knew how to be liked. And he was showing me like he was always one of the popular kids because he, people liked to be around him and he was having, he was fun to be around and he made it fun and entertaining to be around. And if one of his mates, one of his friends was making fun of one of the softer children, the less popular children, um, Freddie would drop that popular that popular person and would just go and now be best friends with the kid he was making fun of. And then just by association, that kid would become popular and envied and welcomed. And Freddie, it was never about his own ability to be popular and just shift social movements in that way. To him, it was about what am I, what am I doing with this? And mm-hmm. he just was born with this instinct. He was born with this powerful personality and this instinct to be an equalizer. You know, he never had an instinct. It, would, it never felt good to him to bully other children, he says, except when I was very small and I was testing out the power. And he, he did try his hand a little bit when he was younger at bullying, but it just made him feel bad. And so he made that decision very early on that he is going to use his his social ability to lift people up and make people feel good because that's what made him feel good. And because he felt born with this intuitive purpose that I'm here to be, I'm here to be this positive force. And he just had limitless energy. Yes. Just like it was just bursting out of his chest and like that peacock walk that we're seeing where he's got the chest forward and his back is arched and he's stepping with his, it's like it felt when he was really going and the, the vibration was just coming pouring out of his chest oh and in the documentary it also said something about how he had four extra sets of teeth like or four extra teeth at the back or something and he had this overbite that he was apparently self-conscious of uh and he says you know everybody needs a humbling um every everybody needs a humbling feature and he's like marilyn monroe had the mole on her face he says i had my extra teeth and it was he was asked well why don't you just have them removed and that'll fix your overbite and he said well he was so he was concerned that it would compromise his palette yeah and that it would change and he says that now that he's it's like since he's died he says it wouldn't have changed his voice at, at that point when he was popular you know it wouldn't have changed his voice to the point that other people would have noticed right. but he would have noticed it would have felt differently and he says and worse than that i would have known that i would have altered something about myself just for the sake of popularity and that mm-hmm. was just the opposite of what he'd been doing his whole life like he already knew from experience that if he knuckled under to what other people wanted him to do or felt that he should do, that that wouldn't feel good. What he learned very early on was doing his own thing and pushing boundaries and experimenting and being loud and performative and unapologetic, that that was the thing that felt good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What else did we uh, need to catch up on? Um, you were talking about musical theater and um, rock operas. Right. Right. So right at the beginning of this documentary, um, right when Bohemian Rhapsody, he says, that's a very sad plant. You need to water it. And it's true. I do need to water those plants before we go today. Um, (laughs) He's just like, (laughs) he's just like petting the plant. And it's just like, it's so sad. He's like, don't you love this plant? I do. I've just, you know, I haven't watered it in a couple, you know, I've meant to water it for a couple of days and I'm a bad plant mom. And he says, you've got these cut flowers that are beautiful. And then over here, you have this plant that's dying of thirst. So I'm, I will immediately water it. <laughs> I will immediately water it. I'm very sorry. Um, it will be okay. It's like it's going to pop back and I'm going to. Well, and I'm going to. The, the thing is, you let it dry out just like a little bit and then you give it some fertilizer and then it will bloom. And he says like, that's. He, he, he's, he says that like, that's cruel because it's celebrating a lo- its own life because it thought it was going to die. And he says, that's very, uh, but then he, he says he never kept a plant alive in his life. So like, he couldn't keep a cactus alive. So. Um, anyway, we were talking about Bohemian Rhapsody and he, um, he said, as soon as Bohemian Rhapsody was mentioned in the documentary, he said, we invented the rock opera. And then immediately started showing all this musical theater stuff that all of this stuff that wouldn't have been possible without Bohemian Rhapsody, which was, um, what were the shows that I mentioned? Like Lion King, he loved. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, Kinky Boots, he loves, loves that show. You mentioned Cats. Right. He, he was. couldn't have been made today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was saying like Cats, 
cats only exist now because it's a classic and that if cats was invented today, it would never have made the stage uh, because he is because Bohemian Rhapsody and his performances change what people expect to see on a stage so much. Oh, Mamma Mia. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, because he says we paved the way for ABBA. Yeah. And he says, and he loves them, but he's, you know, and he says, but it's true. We did. We did that breakthrough work and ABBA huh. came afterwards. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and he says this without any sense of like, I need the credit. Just like, just so we have our facts straight. I did it first yeah. because it wasn't easy to be first. It was 10 times harder to be first than to be second. And he just wants it. He just wants the information to be correct. It's not that he needs the credit for his ego. He just wants the history to be correct. That's why he's here. He says, this is why I'm talking to you. <laughs> That's why I'm taking a moment off from my uh, hedonistic heaven, <laughs> my ideal hedonistic rock star heaven to talk to you. Is I just He just wants the information to be correct. Yeah. And he's teasing a bit. And he says that um, uh, he, didn't want, he didn't want David Bowie to die, mm. but... He felt a little bit guilty because he was like, hurry up and die because he wants to talk to David, wanted to talk to David <laughs> Bowie. <laughs> Steel cut oats take forever. They do. <laughs> you should cook them in the instant pot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should have done that. Yeah. They're easier that way. Yeah. And they're very consistent. Are you recording this? I am. <laughs> and Freddie says, you're talking about porridge? <laughs> Which is the most boring, banal thing we could be discussing when there's a rock star in the room. He's te he's teasing. He's fun. Um, did I miss yeah, anything else? A good English breakfast with porridge and tea. Yeah. No, he says fair point. <laughs> <laughs> he hates porridge. He hated porridge. Yeah. He says uh, sausage for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. He does like applesauce for some reason. Or he suggests you put applesauce in your porridge. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, with some cinnamon. It's the only way you could tolerate it as a boy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, because they fed them porridge a lot of, at school, at boarding oh, school. Yeah. yeah, he just didn't, he just, uh Because it wasn't very good. And he says it wasn't Oliver Twist bad, but it was, <laughs> it was very, you know, we have, a, we have hundreds of boys to feed every day or dozens. Yeah. It wasn't hundreds of boys at his boarding school. It was maybe like less than 100, but. We have dozens of boys to feed every day and they don't really care if the boys like what they were feeding them. And they fed them porridge mostly except on um, special days. Like not even once a week, they wouldn't get like a really good breakfast. So for Freddie, he, his favorite breakfast what is first of all to sleep in and then have sex <laughs> and then to have a full cooked breakfast with like beans and toast and eggs and sausage and orange juice and tea and milk, like just multiple things. And that's, that's his, and by the time you're done sleeping and eating and having sex, it's two in the afternoon and you're ready to start your day. But that's an appropriate time for the, for a rock star who's going to be up until two in the morning. Huh. Yeah. So he's highly suggest he recommends okay. that lifestyle. He says that's the <laughs> rock and roll lifestyle. He recommends it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cause then he says you don't, then you don't have to eat again until right before you go on stage. And he says, that's how I kept slender. <laughs> I think he kept slender because his performances were so uh, um, energetic. Mm. So was there anything else that we needed to catch up on? Um, no, I think that's as far as... Every, as, as far as everywhere we went. Um, did you want to ask him anything? That's kind of what I need your help with. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. I was going to ask where he got his energy, but I think you actually already ended up oh. answering that indirectly. Yeah, where well we can ask that like direct directly where where do you get your where did you get your energy and he says well he was just born with it he was just born with it flowing through and it was just a matter of him learning how to channel it um to to channel it properly so that it felt good yeah and when he was doing the right things in life it felt good uh and that was it that was it and he says he didn't need drugs although he tr certainly tried drugs certainly you know but he never formed um. A terrible habit. Was there rumors about him being addicted? Not that I heard. Okay, no. because because he's making it very clear that he was never a drug addict. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, he... Um, because he just never needed it. Like, nothing ever felt as good as him following this energy that poured through him. Like, nothing ever felt as good as that. He reminds me, actually, honestly, and this is going to sound a little weird, but... 
we talked to a guru one time, like this nice, not the Maharishi, but there was a different guru um, that we talked to that just had, he was also born with this energy that was pouring through him. This is, it's this powerful turned on presence. It's just, the energy is just completely uninhibited. Um, and Freddie went in a completely different direction with it than this, this other guru. I can't remember who it was. Um, it may have just been like an autobiography that we were reading or something long time ago. But anyway, it just reminds me of, it just, it reminds me of this holy energy, you yeah. know, of just, here's this thing that was pouring through him that just propelled him forward. And all he needed to do was listen to his body and his feelings to figure out if he was pointing this energy in the right direction. But it was always just pouring through him no matter what. And he says he felt incapable of self-destructing. And in that way, he was a very lucky rock star mm -hmm. because he never burnt out. He never got addicted to anything um, terrible like heroin, like um, George Harrison did, um, yeah. which was a terrible corrupting uh, force on George Harrison's energy, um, which was a deep wound that he carried that he needed to heal once he was in uh, once he was in spirit. He had to still do some healing. I think a lot of them turned to drugs just to try to sustain that kind of yeah, energy. that energy yeah. that was needed. Yeah. Um, and and that was just natural for Freddie. He just had this limitless energy pouring through him and that was just given to him it was born and he, you can't you can't do anything he says he wants a, every musician everyone that feels bad about not having that energy mm -hmm. don't feel bad um <laughs> because there's nothing you can do about it you're born with that energy or not and he says what really happened with this energy is it left me with very limited choices oh. believe it or not he says i had no choice but to be performative i had no choice but to become famous because that being famous was the only possible outlet for his energy. It was the only possible thing that would give him a wide enough audience that would give him a stadium in which to perform, to, to really get his energy out. Like that was the only time, and he's, he's likening it to like almost like a sexual orgasm. Mm -hmm. And that was the only time that he ever felt like fully satiated was after a massive stadium performance where he felt like he'd gotten it all out. And he could like relax for a second before it started to build up again. Well, that definitely explains some things. Like I hear these stories about him like working on his last studio album, like while he's dying, you know? Really? And, yeah. Just kind of being like, wow, that is, that is a work ethic, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> well, he says, well, what else was I going to do? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> he says he was laying, he was laying in bed. <laughs> He says, well, what's convalescing, you know, watch, watching other people's work like that just, he says, as long as he was alive, he was going to be creating. And if anything, it became more urgent when he was dying because he knew that this was his last time to leave something behind when he was working, when he was working while he was dying. Um, it was about, he was intentionally creating a legacy. He knew he was creating a legacy at that point. And it was his last chance to really leave something behind. And what did he want to say with that? It was incredibly serious. And that urgency, this time limit of his physical body is giving out. He says his physical body gave out, but that ener the energy, the drive never, ever left him. It was just his um, stamina wasn't where he needed it to be. Like he would right. have continued. He would have rather died on stage. Mm -hmm. He would have rather like died at one of these major performances and just you know, gone full blaze until he would have burned out. But he got to the point where he couldn't stand. Like he was still alive, but his body was very weak. And he's describing these physical sores that he had on his body. And he couldn't really sing very well. Like his throat, his voice changed. He got sores in his throat, oh. lesions in his throat. He, di he died of uh, AIDS, didn't he? Yeah. I guess he died before they had any of any treatments that were effective. Yeah, I think he died in like 1990. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. He says that um, that if anything, the way he died is what made him a gay icon mm. because he died of the gay disease. Uh, and then he says, like, there are so many there are so many people that hate gay people, but that love his music that don't like yeah. because, because they don't know that he's gay because that was never a part of that was never a part of his message or his performance. It was about making people feel amazing.
She shows up a lot of sporting events. I mean, yeah, sports fans are necessarily homophobic. Mm-hmm. But, well, that was the first yeah. time I heard "We Will Rock You" was at a hockey game. Yeah. <laughs> West. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was it was totally east west. And I was a cheerleader for like one half a semester there. Courtesy of my dance class. Mm. I was on ice, on ice cheer. In case folks listening to this might not know that Canadians actually literally have on on ice cheerleaders for their hockey games. It's it's like hockey is kind of like football for a lot of Canadians and um, the cheerleaders go out onto the ice. So trying to perform on ice is an extra challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I see you, you know, football cheerleaders, and I raise you on ice anyway. Because <laughs> when you fell, you fell. <laughs> and you just, you didn't want to slip either. And we just had to wear running shoes. Like, it's not like we had special shoes for the ice because we couldn't screw up the ice. And we were, like, lifting each other? Um... I I was not lifting, nor did I get lifted because I wasn't advanced enough in my That's training. Happening. But it was it was happening. It was happening. That's scary. I don't <laughs> think they would be allowed to do what we did anymore because <laughs> of falling on that that ice. But there there was definitely falling, and there was no mats or anything. Like people were on their hands and knees and su- supporting. Um, so, so like it was a three level pyramid, which wasn't like a huge thing. But being on your hands and knees on ice is painful. It's cold and it's hard. Anyway, I'm diverting. Uh, and Freddie says... Um, well, it's about performance. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. He was like, it's, it's about performance. It's about the physical sacrifices you make for performance. Mm-hmm. He says, now he's showing me one time he had a cut. He says it was before he knew that he was really sick, but he knew something was wrong. And he had a cut that wouldn't stop bleeding. Um, and we were talking about the get him to the Greek movie and yes, how, I was thinking about that. yeah, was like going on stage with this like wound. Yeah. But Freddie did that. Freddie had yeah. a wound that was bandaged that wouldn't stop bleeding and he just performed through it. And it, and his bandage was soaked by the end of the uh, performance. He says that like that scene was modeled off of something that really happened to him. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it was like, uh, huh, something philic, he me, something. Matt, give me a feel like there's uh, something that means your blood isn't clotting and hemophilia. hemophilia thank you. Brain's not completely working. What else did you want to ask him? No. He says no pressure, darling. Oh, when I said uh, there's a he was reminding me that uh, when I said to him first that Bohemian Rhapsody was the first song that I ever memorized that wasn't jazz or a you know, yeah. nursery rhyme. He says, Oh, well, good to know. We're still corrupting young minds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good question. It's like, it doesn't matter. Any question, okay. any, anything that just like keeps the flow of the conversation going. Well, I'm curious to know what he would be working on. If you were still around, like, what do you think he would be doing? Mm. Not to be like what you did is not enough. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, no. He, <laughs> he says he often thinks about that because dying for him was a heartbreak. And he's like the grief that he gives that he didn't want to die as young as he died Mm. Um, and that he didn't have a choice like that is that he he would love to still be alive. And he says (laughs) he says Paul McCartney, uh, that wanker slash (laughs) fucker is still performing (laughs) like he's just, you know, loves him but is envious that he still gets to be alive and and gets to enjoy his life and be creative with his partner. And that he says that he doesn't know if he would have settled down with one particular partner, Mm -hmm. but he thinks he would have, and he would have gotten married. Like Mm -hmm. he would have had a more, uh, like one of the things he would have been working on was his personal life. He would have filled out his personal life and had a personal life, more of a personal life. Mm -hmm. Um, And because like he, when he talks with George Harrison, that's one of the things that he he envies because George got a very a life that was full of a lot of really rich relationships that stayed with him for years. And Freddie had a lot of he says, we'll call them butterfly encounters. You know, <laughs> they were beautiful and transient uh, and and dramatic and touching and magical, but they were fleeting and temporary and gone before you knew it. It had ha- it happened and then it was over. Uh, and he says there was someone that he traveled with. I don't know if he was a member of the crew. He wasn't someone on stage. 
<clears throat> that he had um, a shorter kind of term relationship, maybe two years, around two years. And that was one of the longer relationships. But it was just, it became draining of the energy. It became a bit draining of Freddie's energy. And he felt like, Freddie felt that he couldn't really give this man like the love and attention and devotion that the relationship needed to survive. And so he says, it was like that plant. I wasn't watering it enough, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And he says, and I just couldn't watch him suffer because I did love him, but I couldn't water him enough. Uh, and so they broke up and then Freddie didn't have another, like he had many great friendships and he had many lovers, but he didn't have a marriage. And he says, that's what he would be. That's what he would have achieved if he'd still lived. And he says, because the music, music was something, it didn't take a lot of effort for him to produce. It just, it came through him. And he knows certainly he would still be producing art right. um, because that's just what he did by existing. But, you know, that's, if he had been able to still be alive and, uh, and now he's talking about the Rolling Stones, <laughs> you know, like the, those fuckers, <laughs> he's like, I would be, he would be having, um, he, he would learn how to take a vacation. Paul McCartney and the Rolling Stones, I mean, they, mm -hmm. they got like a full decade head start on their careers mm -hmm. um, compared to Queen, right? Yeah. He says it's 10 times harder to be first yeah. than it is to be second. And I mean, with love to the Beatles, with love to the Stones, with love to like everybody, because he says that he couldn't have gone where he had gone without Zeppelin, without... Like there was really edgy bands that went before him that never became famous, but that carved out the niche. Yep. And he says that th those were the inspiration for him to, instead of have the softer, he says that the look wasn't really there. The statement wasn't really there um, it w within his band. Like they were just wearing loose fitting shirts and kind of regular pants and their hair was like kind of grown out in a way that was fashionable. And, but they didn't like really have a look. There was nothing about them that was iconic. Yeah. He says, we look really sad to be perfectly honest. And he said that it was these bands that had come before them that inspired them to put on leather with fringe. And that's what really did it. The leather with fringe was where it started to get to be a bit fetishy. And it was that getting tiptoeing into the fetish that Freddie went, this is brilliant. It's like, this is where we need to push. It's not just about pushing boundaries with our music. We have to push boundaries with our personalities and with our looks. Mm -hmm. And when he realized how strongly people were reacting to just tight leather pants, mm -hmm. then he was like, well, if you're going to react this way to tight leather pants, you just wait and see. I'll give you a tight white satin <laughs> unitard and he's you know and sweat in it for a you know 16 hours until like he says until my the smell of his ball sweat is like saturating through the tv screen like he's he'll just go he, he, he loved it once once the fashion part of it clicked and then he's showing me that he loved kiss and what how kiss took glam rock because kiss paid tribute to him yeah. and they were actual fans of him like he he has affection for them. Yeah. Mhm. Mm and yeah, he loves and great. yeah, and he loves what they did. He yeah. loves how they took glam rock in a different direction and he loves that because no one's they've been com perfectly original, completely original. And also the joy in the music. He says and um he says with Kurt Cobain, he's like the depression that everyone went through in the 90s um and he he says that it the mus the depression in the music scene was a direct result of the AIDS crisis. No, oh, that makes sense. <clears throat> because everyone in the alternative scene, all of the misfits all lost multiple friends to this horrible disease. And the, you know, they were that, that everyone was saying that they deserved to get and die of. Mm -hmm. um, and so the nineties was a backlash to the horrible callousness um, of towards the AIDS epidemic. And so that's why, like, Kurt's music was so depressive. Um, and, like, why, gr why, too, why grunge needed to happen. Yeah. He was, yes. And Abba. <clears throat> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Kurt went straight looking for them. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, I'm dead. My, my, I'm dead. <laughs> oh, like, it wasn't a big relief or anything. Like, he had to kind of go, oh, I'm dead. Shit. Wow. 
And then, but like, I'm still around. And then immediately he's like, if I'm still around, then all of my dead icon idols are still around. And he immediately was like starting to look for them and trying to figure out like, what the fuck was that? What the fuck was that that just <laughs> happened? And, um, and Freddie says, he just shows me like holding Kurt while he was crying because Kurt went to him right away. Like he was one of the first ones just like kind of stroking his hair and just being, you know, it's okay. I'm sorry that you went through this because it's like, it was like holding a child that he couldn't protect because he had died too soon to be able to protect or mentor that generation of musician. And that's hugely emotional yeah. for him. Hugely yeah. emotional that he couldn't, he couldn't have been there to help mentor Kurt and that Kurt had to face those horrible record record executives by himself you know, with the, with their manipulation and that Kurt was such a, a baby. He was such an innocent by comparison. And Freddie says he was no innocent. Freddie went to boarding school and was very independent and had this flamboyant, like, like this endless energy. And Kurt didn't have that endless energy. Kurt was a sensitive and he was a recluse in a lot of ways. And he really needed, he needed a um, musical parent that he could look up to. And Kurt had some he had like kind of foster parents in a way, like he had people in his life that helped to fill that in. Mm -hmm. And Kurt had the drive that propelled him forward. Yeah. Um, like, which was more of a restlessness than an endless energy. It was a discomfort. Um, and yeah, I think Michael Stipe tried to be that, but it was like kind of too late by that point. Yeah. Was yeah. he one of the ones from Guns N' Roses? No, he's uh, the guy from Ariam. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because he was, and Freddie says that, Michael was a survivor too. Mm. Yeah. Michael was one of the remaining survivors. Was he gay? I think he's bi. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like he knew, he knew about it. Yeah. Oh, this reminds me of something that we were talking about earlier where Freddie was saying where he was wearing the, um, Oh, sorry. Michael Stipe. He, he described himself as an equal opportunity lech. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever, whatever pansexual, whatever you want to call it, yeah. but yeah, equal opportunity. That's good. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, but that reminds me of Freddie saying, talking about he, how he wore flamboyant clothing, not for his own sake, but for the sake of the people that um, really needed to wear that clothing to feel like the, they were to be themselves. And he's also acknowledging that Kurt did that too. Mm -hmm. You know, Kurt wore dresses and he says the only difference is they looked horrible on Kurt <laughs> because Kurt didn't style them, but it was, that was a part, it was like the grunge version of drag. And he said, which was really quite depressing, like everything else, <laughs> but people wanted to feel depressed. And so it was fitting. <laughs> so yeah, Freddie is just like the grunge aesthetic is not really like. <laughs> The grunge mm -hmm. aesthetic doesn't really go with drag. Yeah. <laughs> but Kurt. Polish it out maybe, but then that's not the point. Yeah, because like, he's showing me like having a full beard and wearing a dress and putting lipstick and having hairy legs and no pantyhose. This is like a part of drag <laughs> is putting pantyhose over the balls. That's a part of it. You have to have balls and pantyhose in order for drag to be occurring. Mm. Or you tight pants. <laughs> in freddie's opinion <laughs> and kurt like takes his drag on the cigarette and is like yeah well you know that's that's why we need the younger generation to come through and like show you that you don't need to be restricted to the to the drag gender norms <laughs> and then freddie says there's nothing ladylike about a pair of balls hanging free under a skirt unless it's a, unless it's a kilt but you, that's not what we're talking about and under a ball gown mm. And then Kurt just kind of like he shifts and he says it's much more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So they're having like this little fashion back and forth about how, you know, fashion is the antithesis to comfort. And then Kurt says, we'll tell, tell that to the grunge movement, like the clothing movement mm -hmm. that happened. Um, you know, everyone with the plaid shirts. And I mean, I had a single plaid shirt that I wore seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And I just, I wore it as a sweater, you know, but I don't think I washed it very regularly, Yeah, you know, and you wore it over jeans with holes in it. And maybe you wore like long underwear under the jeans, even in summer. And you had some sort of like a ripped t-shirt over it. I, I don't think I wore the ripped t-shirt. I think I was more like crushed velvet and lace with the jeans. Like I had a little bit of a feminine mm -hmm. because I was in dance at that point too. So I didn't go quite, quite as um, androgynous with it as I might have. 
Queen is so much my, like, Bohemian Rhapsody, when we first started talking to Kurt and I didn't really know who he was, like, I knew Smells Like Teen Spirit, but I didn't know Kurt Cobain. Mm -hmm. And similar to, like, John Lennon. And, and you know, it's like I the music was sort of around, but I didn't know who these individuals were because I just, you know, apologies, but I just wasn't into music. You know, Alanis Morissette was the only artist that I ended up kind of latching on to. She was a Canadian and like it was just like the right yeah. songs at the right time. Um, even Tori Amos, I wasn't really that into her. Um, so it's like music wasn't my thing. I was much more into visual art. Art, Visual art was my thing and writing was my thing. I wasn't into sound because sound so frequently made me feel uncomfortable. But I know like Queen, that's music that I that moved me. Because you always liked musical theater, though, and you like classical yeah, music. So that's true. It gives you an in. Yeah, actually. Yeah. He reached me. Yeah. <laughs> I did always like musical theater. You're right. Because um, <laughs> Les Mis, uh, like uh, Les Mis, I also memorized on the same trip that I was introduced to Queen. I was also introduced to musical theater. Les Mis was yeah. my very first musical. and it, It's kind of funny. Yeah. Sort of like, instead of bringing... Um, you know, high culture to the masses. You ended up bringing like you, who are like more into high culture, like into the rock world. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's uh, hot. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny that you call it high culture because I I just think of it as like I was just a nerd and too uncool to like <laughs> even be tuned into what was going on in pop culture around me. You know? <laughs> but Freddie broke through all that. Yeah. <laughs> Queen broke through all of that. Was well, it Neil Gaiman? Orchestras in the theater. That's like. You know. Yeah. <laughs> was it Neil Gaiman that said that any cassette left long enough in a car would turn into a Queen album? Oh yeah, I think he. I think that in one of his novels, didn't he? I think that was Neil Gaiman. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, what book was that? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. He's written so many weird books. What? What else? What else do you want to ask him? This is why I need Sweetie's help, because when I'm in medium mode, I can't think of my own questions. He says you could ask me about my childhood. Um, sure. <laughs> you want to ask him anything specific? He says so little is known about his childhood and so much is known and has been analyzed about his... I think he wants to talk about it. <laughs> adult life? Yeah, he wants to talk about things that are like not as well known. What was Zanzibar like? Oh... Lo loved it he loved it and he says that that's why he didn't really go on vacations because he he felt like his childhood was a vacation mm. um he loved his mother loved his father they were supportive they were proud of him um he the only he didn't receive a lot of discipline but it wasn't necessary because whenever he sort of did something that broke the rules he never endangered himself or anybody else he had too much sense for that um, and so all it really took was a talking to, and because he was surrounded by rational adults who would, instead of demanding, um, obedience, blind obedience, the adults would have a conversation with him and say, well, why did you do that? And then here's my concerns as an adult about the safety of the situation, if there was one, or the adult would be able to see that he had addressed the safety of the situation. Um, although as a child, usually he needed to be reminded you know, you don't wander off into the, uh, he's showing me this big, like sand, the sandy dunes. Um, you don't wander off into that because there are snakes and that's dangerous. And you certainly don't take a younger child with you because you're responsible for that younger child that you take with you. And what if this child, you know, you would have, like, you would feel so terrible if this child got injured. And that's what, that's why we ask you to stay within the compound because like for your, not only for your own sake, but for the sake of the child. So he's like, he wanted to go off exploring. Um, so, and, and as a child, he was capable of taking that feedback, you know, he would say, oh, all, all right then. Yes. You know, I'm sorry. And I won't do it again. And he meant it. So he was, a, he was really quite a rational child. Um, and so he didn't have the need for a lot of, um, behavioral modification in that way because he had, um, parents that were very, uh, supportive, not permissive hippie parents, but parents that wanted him to be independent and so would let him try things and would let him fail and then would help give him the skills to cope with failure. That's what really he owes his success to mm. is his early childhood experiences where his parents didn't, they would let him try something that they knew he was going to fail at. 
because this was an opportunity to teach him how to cope with failure. Yeah. And the message that they really taught him was, well, what did you learn from this failure? And now you go forward and you try again. It's just like a part of the process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a valuable lesson. So Zanzibar was, he says, Zanzibar is what, what formed me. It's what made me, it's what made me different because he says that he wasn't Indian and nor was he British. Mm -hmm. um, and so he got to realize that whoever we think we are, whatever we think our identity is, it's just an accident of birth. And we're just brainwashed into thinking that's who we are. Yeah. But because of where he grew up, beautiful Zanzibar, because of being in this British colony in this Indian place, he got to realize how much of a social construct our own identities are. And that gave him the power to choose to remake himself later. He says he had a small pet rabbit for a short time that he loved. <laughs> named, I wonder if it was named Fluffy or something like that. <laughs> Didn't last for a long time, was, uh, was like injured before it really grew up. Um, but he did love it. And that was like his first heartbreak. It was his beloved rabbit that died. He says, <laughs> we've got quite a precocious cat. <laughs> quite yeah. a needy cat. Yes, we do. It came out of what he was saying about how like if he were alive, he would focus on relationships. Mm. Um, so like, does he think that it's hard for artists to balance like their work and their health and their relationships? And if so, mm. like why? He says balance is hard for everybody. And he says, you just don't get to see why balance is hard for everybody because so many people sacrifice the art within themselves. Mm. They just don't give art space in their life. And so it just looks like they're balancing things better when really they've cut out a part of themselves. And that's why people need artists like you and I. That's why people need art because it's expressing that which is unexpressed within themselves. People need a surrogate. But the majority of people need a surrogate. He says, you can say the thing that you're holding back. Um, well, I don't know. It's like you see so many, not so many artists, but like, you know, like famous artists, let's say, who've like, um, of, of any medium, you know, with like terrible relationships or like mm -hmm. health problems, you know, mm. but yeah, maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe it's just like, oh, you know, if you focused on the other things, then you're, you just sort of like, you haven't kind of filled out the pie in another section. You know? mm. Is that a question? <laughs> well, he's, take, he's, he's taking it in and it's difficult for him because he says he can only speak to his own experience because he was born with this limitless energy. Mm. And so it's very difficult for him to give you advice on how to balance your energy because you're the authority on your energy and how to balance that. Uh, and he says that the, his best advice is, is to be as bossy as you need to be to get the art to where you want it to be. Okay. Um, he says <clears throat> that artists really get into trouble. They get um, self-destructive and morose and... They get into positions where others are taking advantage of them. And now he's showing me Basquiat mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they've got this energy flowing through them and they have to be artists, but they let other people tell them how to be artists. Yeah. And they stop saying, no, this is what I need. This is how my art is going to go. Because he says Queen would never, ever have existed if we had allowed other people input. Yeah. This is my creativity. You have to be fierce about it. You have to defend it. And then he says, as for health, he also says life, life is difficult. Life brings different challenges to different people. And he says his great grief is that he died as young as he did. And he says that wasn't an imbalance. He, he's, he says it wasn't an imbalance issue. He doesn't see it as one, but he says oh, you could yeah. you could argue it as an imbalance issue because he didn't have a singular relationship. He had these multiple little trysts, which resulted in this 
contraction of this disease that killed him. I was thinking, like, I wasn't thinking of him when I said that. I was thinking more of, mm-hmm. like, um, drugs and alcohol. Yeah. But your behavior, he says your behavior is a result of, like, what you allow yourself in life. Yeah. And he okay. says that some people, like the other extreme, is pe- people that are complete assholes on behalf of their art. And right. they alienate everybody around them. But that's the relationships component, right? Yeah. 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 So there is no balance. <laughs> There's, the, he, yeah. said, he says, there is no balance. There's only what you want from life. Okay. And he, it's like he wants to bless you with a kiss on your forehead. Mm-hmm. So my other question. He says, be brave, art, little artist. <laughs> be brave, artist. You are a warrior. <laughs> um, my other question about art was, I remember he said something about how these other bands had paved the way mm. kind of for Queen. And um, it's sort of like, it sort of goes with this theory that I'm sort of like tossing around in my mind about like there being artists that are <clears throat> like innovators and artists that are popularizers and that it's hard to be both. And um, like, would you agree with that? Well, he says we did it. We were innovators and popularizers. And he oh, said, so, yeah. he says, you know, he is referring back to when he said it's 10 times more difficult to be first than second. But he says, when you're not comparing yourself to anyone else, you don't realize that it's hard or harder than Mm -hmm. it could be. And he says, what trips people up and what robs them of their gifts and their true creativity is when they start comparing themselves to others. Don't look at what anyone else is doing. Look only at what you want to accomplish. I mean, I guess like my question is kind of sort of like, can an artist or an audience understand something that they haven't seen before? Like, are they going to get it the first time? Or are they going to kind of go, mm. well, that's dumb, <laughs> you know? And then the next time be like, oh, you know, that's brilliant. Like, you know, when the first punk band showed up wearing garbage bags, I'm sure people weren't like, wow, these guys are geniuses, <laughs> you know? He says, well, and then he's saying Bohemian Rhapsody was her fourth album. Yeah. So he says, sometimes you have to pave your own way. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> so don't expect instant success. And he also says that the thing that that is going to be that popular success or viral, like he's fascinated with online and viral culture now. Mm. Um, because if any of this had been around in his day, uh, they would have owned it. They would have been all over the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and approached things in a completely different way than they did. They wouldn't have had to go through a music company or record company. Um, they would have done it completely on their own. Uh, so he says that like you don't, the first, you know, two dozen, six dozen things that you do is not going to be the thing that goes viral, but you just need the one thing that it's like, like that one hit that propels you and then retroactively makes your work relevant and classic. And he says, and you never yeah, know when that's going to strike. That's really true. You never know when that is going to strike. And so you keep your head down and you keep working and you keep working towards your goals. Oh yeah. That's the same thing about the, the overnight success that I put in 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Easy to forget. And he says my entire life was training for this. Mm-hmm. And he, he also says that not to value your work based on the circle of people who are acknowledging its value right now. You don't value your work based on that because you don't know the impact of your work um, and or its importance or its significance uh, while you're alive. You don't get to know that. And he says, it, in, in a way, it was easy for me to see that my work, I was going to be leaving behind a legacy and, and that responsibility. And But he says, you don't want that brand of famous. Mm-hmm. You don't want that. So you, your famous, your success is going to look like something else. And what does that look like? And he is questioning you because he thinks that you don't actually have a clear vision of what success looks like to you. 
Yeah. He says, it's all right, darling. <laughs> and then he says, take comfort because the thing that's within you that wants something, this thing that's driving you that wants something, he says, that's the energy that you have. That's the restlessness that made Kurt famous. He like It's that discomfort at standing still. That's what makes you an artist. And so he says, it's all right that you don't know what it is. It's all right that you don't know exactly what it looks like to you. But like that feeling of discomfort that you're, you're feeling right now, that conflict, is it's like you can at least say, all right, I feel miserable right now, but it's because I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> Because you don't have the option of setting it aside. And so take comfort in that. Take comfort that you're not going to give up. You won't, you're, you've got this energy in you that propels you forward, and that's the gift. That's your gift. Yeah. So just keep working forward and try the next thing and try the next thing. Hmm. You just keep going. He says, that's, that's all it is. That's all this life is. That's all <laughs> this game is about is you just keep going. You roll the dice every day, one more time. Sometimes it comes, sometimes it comes up sixes, and sometimes it comes up snake eyes. And uh, either way, you're rolling the dice again, and then I hear doesn't really matter. Mm. Success or failure doesn't really matter. He says, stop trying to evaluate your your life on a ruler that you didn't make. Mm -hmm. He says it's all right. <laughs> We're done now. It's all right. And he says, I'll be around. Talk again. He's being um, like sexually explicit. Because <laughs> like there's theories about whether he's a top or a bottom. <laughs> <laughs> his, his answer is both. Mm. Mm -hmm. And he says like he'd, she'd try anything. What are our bodies if not for enjoyment? And he's, so now he's answering questions that are coming in from somewhere else. And maybe these are questions that are coming in from people listening to this in the future or something. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's, that. yeah. And he says, um, like, one of the questions is, like, do you, do you regret your sexual activity knowing that you contracted the mm -hmm. disease that killed you? And he says, well, no, of course not, because I couldn't have known. And he says that he was blessed to be born in a in a time um, where when he was really coming into his power and his his career in the 60s and 70s, it was the counterculture was very strong. And so it made you cool. It was empowering to go and do the things you weren't supposed to do. Yeah. free love like sex without consequence um you know rock and roll is the devil and cross-dressing and you know all of the things that like breaking all of these societal norms and look we're rebuilding society society isn't falling apart because we're breaking these ridiculous rules we're rebuilding society mm -hmm. and so for him his, his promiscuity was a part of that he was a part of that revolution and if he had not uh, he, and then he's also saying that it, he wasn't capable of watering a relationship enough. He wasn't able to do that with. And, and then he says, he's showing back to your question about balancing things. Mm -hmm. He says like he, he didn't have a balanced life. He didn't have that relationship. Um, and so that his choice was to have multiple tris or be celibate. And he didn't, there's nothing cool about a celibate rock star. There's nothing enjoyable about being a celibate rock star. You just get cranky, get backed up. So, no, he doesn't regret it. He doesn't regret his promiscuity. He says that he never questioned how long he would live. Like, he never assumed, he never really thought about it. He never assumed, hi, buddy. He never assumed that he was going to have a long life. And he never assumed he was going to die young either. He just... Um, he just never thought about it. It was always about, well, what is the next thing? And one day the next thing was, I have this illness that's actually impacting my ability to do my art. And that's how it ended. Um, and his disappointment was, you know, oh, well, that's it already. That's it. It's over. And it was almost unbelievable to him. 
um, but there was no regret. There was no, um, nothing he would have done differently. He says he, he did a good job. He did. And how he can tell he did a good job was because as he was going along, that feeling of the energy pouring out of him without having to restrict it. That's what he says. You can tell you're doing it right when you're not having to restrict a lot. And now he's saying that um, he had the combination of energy and charisma that allowed him to get away with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but he, he says that like he stands by saying that when it comes to your art and when it comes to your life, you shouldn't have to inhibit yourself to the point of discomfort or you'll never be happy. I have a follow-up question. Yes. Um, so he was talking about the counterculture in the 60s and 70s and pushing boundaries. And so, like, nowadays, you know, young people get a lot of criticism for continuing to push these boundaries because, you know, people say, oh, well, all this work has already been done and, you know, now you guys are just being spoiled. Mm -hmm. So what does he think about that? Well, he like burst out laughing because the irony of the baby boomer generation telling their grandchildren not to rebel. He says yeah. the baby boomer generation should remember the 60s and 70s and should remember what that was like. And they failed to they fail as a culture to see how rebellion is so necessary and how pushing boundaries is so necessary for moving a culture forward. Because without active rebellion, you slide into dictatorships. You slide into an ever-increasing conservative. Mm. An ever-restricting... And then he says this is what happened in, uh, in Iran. That it was a liberal, thriving culture, um, society for hundreds of years and the artists and the performers and the like every, it got so comfortable that it became vulnerable to a restrictive takeover to a dictatorship takeover. And it's been held hostage um, since the, uh, I want to hear a hundred years, but then I get, it's not been quite that long. So you think they just got complacent? They got complacent is what he says, yes. They got complacent. And when a takeover happened, they weren't organized enough to know what to do. Everyone was just running for their lives. That artists and having a culture of rebellion and questioning and holding officials accountable, it's a part of what, it's, it's a part of cultural safety. Just like having a military is a part of border safety it prevents a you know a, a bigger meaner country from coming in and taking over you know that he says that artists and the counterculture is essential it's an it's an immune system mm -hmm. it prevents the cancer from setting in can there be room for conservatives to be conservatives and like progressives to be progressive and all exist mm -hmm. yes in the same space? yes yeah and he says that he doesn't like the labels conservatives and progressives. He doesn't like that yeah. at all. He says that that's part of the problem Yeah, is dividing people into two sides when there's, you know, hundreds of sides. Yeah. He says it comes down to people just energetically being different. And some people want to be, want to have lives that are very well-defined and safe. Um, and they, their inse the insecurity can sometimes take them to support someone that says, I'm going to make your entire society secure and safe. Mm. And so they buy into that yeah. because that's just their personalities. <clears throat> but the person who says, give me power, I'm going to make you secure and safe. They're just playing on the fears of that conservative person. They're not actually conservative themselves. Mm -hmm. They're going to play for whatever side wins, whatever side has, side has the vulnerability because the predators in society are going to go wherever there's an opportunity. And that's why, these labels, conservative, liberal, they're not, they don't have meaning. They just serve to divide. Yeah, it definitely means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that perspective. So he says, yes, like the conservatives who want to have a quiet traditional life um, with well-watered plants 
and <laughs> and flourishing children um in a small community where every where everyone fits in um and it and then he's showing me that conservatism isn't being mean it's just you know when when there's a an unusual child growing up in a small conservative town that child is going to feel unusual and the conservative people are maybe not going to understand that child but conservatism doesn't make people cruel to that child mm-hmm. that the culture makes conservatives cruel to that child and that is what the counterculture is for well, like did you slide it in another reminder there to water your plants really bother them? i know it's really i'm sorry <laughs> i really should have watered it day before yesterday and it's actually drooping now he says, you'll water it immediately next time you get up. That's all right. He's just teasing me, too, because he knows that I love my plants and just that I would, like, momentarily neglect it. Yeah. It's like, it's fine. It'll it'll bounce back. It's fine. Well, that was about an hour. I think that was really good. Yeah. I think it's a good place to stop. He says, I, I'm saying thank you very much. And he really likes this cat, and he thinks we should dye Mikey pink. With beet juice and make him a real rock and roll cat. <laughs> He's so cute. Maybe shave his sides, give him a mohawk. <laughs> he says he'd let you do it. He'd let you do it if you were nice, nice enough to him. He would. Um, and he is, he likes Rupert, um, and like the, the that Rupert's the boss. Like the energy translated as Rupert's a boss bitch, but that's not what exactly he said. It was like Rupert's in charge. Rupert's yeah. the queen. Rupert's Rupert doesn't need a single thing. So don't like, don't, he wouldn't need, Rupert would not need anything to go on stage and perform, (laughs) you know, um, you know, Mikey to, in order to be a rock and roll cat would, would benefit from some like pink beet juice and like a side shave and you have to talk him up a little bit. Yeah. He, it would give him some confidence. Yeah. Yeah, It would give him some confidence. Um, and he does, he really likes, he finds Mikey very charming. He really likes cute, small animals, Mm -hmm. you know, he liked gerbils. That he had a gerbil as a pet when he was a kid, too. Oh, that they were very popular in India. Because they were, um, like, that's where they come from. I didn't know that. Oh. Mm -hmm. And it's not exactly the same gerbils that we would see Mm -hmm. growing up. It's like, they're sort of like these cute little mice, but they've got an extra little floof at the end of their tail. It's really adorable, actually. Yeah. It's really cute. And he says, and he would never hurt. Um, He was vegetarian. Yeah, he was vegetarian, and, and that's something that's not known about him, I guess. Um, but it was just like how he preferred, he would eat beans and bread, and he would eat eggs. Um, Wasn't he talking about eating sausages earlier? Or maybe he was, he was, just, make, like, he was like, making a joke. He would eat sausages, yeah. This is sexual innuendo. <laughs> it was sexual innuendo. He did eat sausages, yes, with like franks and beans and that kind of thing. But like, so he, I guess he wasn't restrictive, Yeah. but he just, his palate, like he didn't really like chicken. You know, like he just, he didn't like, if it was a big, like fleshy thing of meat, I don't know, sausage was like processed, so it didn't have quite the texture of meat. Like he just, he wasn't a big, um, he didn't like meat that reminded him that it used to be an animal. Yeah. It bothered him. So he never got around to, I guess, pulling a George Harrison or a Paul McCartney and becoming like fully vegetarian. But, um. You know, it was whenever he was like given a steak dinner or something in a hotel room, he just left the steak. He just ate around it, ate the beans and the potatoes and, you know, ate the gravy. But Mm -hmm. he liked pasta. He was a terrible cook. And he says that every once in a while, this is hilarious. Every once in a while when he wanted a really good meal, he would go home with a girl and ask that she cook for him. (laughs) And she always would. But it was like to him, it's like he would have sex with her. But to him, it was like the meal was really the pleasure that he was going for. That answers a question from like earlier in the discussion when he was like talking about like, Mm -hmm. oh, it's really good to like sleep in and then, you know, have sex and then get Mm -hmm. up and have like a really big breakfast. And like there were girls lover cooking this for you. Yeah. Like you're in a hotel. Yeah. No, (laughs) there were girls around when he was showing me that with that scenario. he, He wasn't there with a bunch of men. He was there with a bunch of girls, like three girls. And that particular scenario was a hotel room and there was room service, Mm -hmm. but he liked to recreate that. You know, he would go home with a girl and, you know, and they would have sex because that was like his, his sort of exchange, you know, it's like, please cook, cook for me and I'll, I'll have sex with you and you will, you will have had sex with Freddie Mercury and I will have had a wonderful meal and we're both happy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm. And he says that, um, 
um, that the girls would be able to say like that they'd had sex with Freddie Mercury, um, but they would never talk in great detail about exactly what happened because often the sex wasn't like to completion or anything. Like he would, mm. um, he would like let them take the lead and he wanted to make sure that they were happy and he was obliging. Um, but you know, when they were done, he was done. You know? mm-hmm. And that was it. Like he didn't, he didn't need to, uh, become fulfilled through his encounters through them sexually. Like that wasn't the poor, like they didn't really have a chance of giving him what he kind of wanted sexually, but he could give them what they wanted. And so it was a, it was fair. And, and he enjoyed their company too, um, to, to a degree, but he says that he found, um, he would get kind of impatient with them or tired of them fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, after, after breakfast, then he was sort of ready to move on with his day and, and he wouldn't really, he says that he, he tried not to treat them callously, um, but it was difficult to pretend that he cared about them and that, that he hurt some feelings as mm-hmm. a result of that, because it was obvious that he didn't really care. Um, yeah. and that was sort of, that was a little, you know, hurtful, um, and he didn't mean to be. He was genuinely sorry that he hurt people's feelings, but it was he was tired oft, often these times. He says that it was often um, more relaxing to be with women when he just really needed to rest because women would sort of be nurturing and would be quiet and weren't needy kind of in the same way and let him just kind of be and would feed him. And <laughs> <laughs> um, But he felt that the girls, especially that he attracted were um, like they, they, they were immature. A lot of them. Mm-hmm. So we couldn't really have a conversation with them. So they weren't exciting in that way. He says, Oh, that's a, he just, he wanted to end it on a note of like, he's not this perfect. He wasn't this perfect person, this miraculous um, being that was born with energy and a sense of direction and, you know, only did good in his life. You know, he was saying like he, he hurt people along the way that he didn't really intend to, but didn't really have the energy to kind of prevent people from hurting themselves on him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so he energy just, was finite. Then yes, it was. Just, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was. Directed and directions. this was the sort of thing that happened after he started doing big concerts. Like he would spend himself mm-hmm. and he did need to recover a bit afterwards. But he says that he loved his bandmates. Yeah. He didn't talk he he didn't talk a lot about his bandmates in this interview, but he really wants it known that it's like those are the people he really enjoyed spending time with. And those are the people that he was loyal to. And they kept each other's secrets and they protected each other. And he says he won't violate um like he's keeping his secrets even after death, you know? He won't yeah. talk about that. Anyway, he's cheery cheerio he buys and <laughs> you know have a good morning and and then he looks around at our environment at our community where we're living and says this is all right (laughs) he likes it that's it for this episode of the joyful telepathy podcast thank you so much for listening if you would like to book a session with me click on the link in this episode's description or visit to phenopsychic.com and you my dear listener please use coupon code P-O-D-C-A-S-T. That's coupon code podcast for $20 off your first session. Until next time, be well and take care of each other.